Happy New Year, everybody. Happy 2024. New Year. Another year. Got a lot of uh, activities coming on this year, so got another exciting year in the world of astronomy. So, welcome to the January 2024 meeting of the Memphis Astronomical Society. We got a great program for you guys tonight. We've got Dr. Bustler coming up. Full talk tonight on Sirius and a little bit of stellar evolution sprinkled in with several images from some of our our astrophotographers. So this will be a very informative program. So stick around for that. Before we get started, a few preliminaries here. Again, we're the Memphis Astronomical Society, nonprofit public service organization promoting interest in education and astronomy and related sciences. The best way to learn about us is on our website. And of course, we've got a Facebook group and a YouTube channel. So make sure you subscribe if you haven't already. If you would like to join and become a member, just scan that QR code right there. It's also on our banner out front, or if you're watching this uh, virtually via YouTube, this is how you can either subscribe to our email list, or if you want to become a full-fledged member, only $25 a year, have it raised membership rates. One of the few things that has not gone up significantly in the current administration, so just want to point that out there. And the reason is because we've got a good pool of members, so we can keep doing exciting things like this program, as well as... Uh, you know, other, other benefits of being a member. So anyway, if you're interested, just scan that QR code. Uh, you can also go to our website, memphisastro.org. Just click the join button. And again, you can either subscribe to our email list and or just, like, like I said, join as a full-fledged member. So two options for you. Um, quick review here of the calendar of events that we've got coming up. January 11. This time of year is always kind of touch and go. We got a winter storm coming, historically cold temperatures. Uh, we'll remind everybody, if you haven't already, make sure you do three things this weekend, okay? Number one, if you haven't already, cover your outside spigots. Get these little styrofoam things. They're only three bucks at Lowe's or Home Depot. Make sure you cover all of those. Number two, starting Sunday afternoon, open the cabinet doors under your kitchen and, and bathroom because that kind of lets the heat in. Number three, trickle the water. I do a slow stream. You can drip it if you want to. I do all my faucets. If you want to just do one or two, I'm in real estate, if you haven't figured this out. Pipes freezing is a very bad thing. We're getting down to zero Monday and Tuesday. Historically bad. Whatever water you waste is a lot cheaper than redoing the house. Exactly. <laughs> it's, right. it's not going to affect your bill that much. So Stream your water, open your cabinets, and cover your outside spigots and you should be okay. And if you're not, don't blame me. I'm just giving you some advice. But frozen pipes, very bad. Um, having said that, we were scheduled to be at Astro Flats tomorrow night. I think we're canceled, correct? So it's not only- It's very muddy. Very muddy. It's the first time I think we've canceled a, a, an observing event due to mud. So you wouldn't want to go, go there and get stuck. If you go there tomorrow night, you could be there for a while. So yeah, we'll reschedule, but- um. All the ground would be solid Sunday. So yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> but you might be in it. <laughs> Not going to get you out, but it will be, be, it will be solid. So, so, yeah, we will cancel tomorrow night, January the 13th, and we'll reschedule. Uh, the 18th, well, we had two events next week. I think they're both canceled as far as I know. Mark is actually traveling, so he won't be back until tomorrow. But we had a Boy Scout or a Scout event next Tuesday. I know that's going to be rescheduled. And then on the 18th, we had Jeter Elementary Space Week, but the advanced forecast, I don't think is looking really bad too. I think we got more, more winter weather coming. So we're kind of wiping out next week. And I think our next event is the 20th at Pinson Mounds. And I'm not sure that's even going to be a go either. So um, not a lot, not a lot of... Uh, of news right now on the observing front. But again, stay tuned to your email list. And as we get through some of the winter weather, speaking of winter, who's appropriately dressed, you know? <laughs> this is the time to bundle up. So we'll get back out there again soon. But uh, yeah, not much going on in the next week. Uh, I wanna welcome some of our new members here real quickly. If I butcher your name, just if you're online and I say your name and it's incorrectly, then just let me know. Ben Koa. Koabani, uh, John Rennekamp, Mandy Hoffman, Antoinette Carter, Jacob Perry, 
and Robert Green, just approved. Welcome everybody to our new members. I won't put you on the spot, but if you're online or you're in person, happy to have you a part of our organization. Uh, and again, reminder, if you are a member, you get access to the Meteorite. Check out this month's edition. Uh, Astro Flats, we just talked about this. Again, this is one of the benefits of being a member. You get access to our members only observing site. We're canceled tomorrow night, but you can go anytime, seven days a week. So it's not just specific times, but uh, you can get out, if you become a member, you can get access to that on our Slack channel, correct? So there's a gate code, we give you that. And if it's clear on a Tuesday night or a Saturday evening, uh, you can go anytime. So keep that in mind for those of you who are considering becoming a member. Uh, next astrophotography group meeting is next Thursday. So, okay. 7 p.m. Oh, it's 7 p.m. Okay, so that's the incorrect time. 7 p.m., not 8 p.m. Next Thursday, the 18th, you're snowed in, got nowhere to go, it's cold. So uh, very exciting group. They, we, they call themselves the Mass Fits, and I'll, I'll spare you the, the details of why. But uh, anyway, this group is doing some really exciting stuff, as you're about to see tonight in this presentation. I'll have a, an assignment for them. And then, and you're, okay, you're going to have an assignment from, uh, from our speaker tonight, Dr. Bustler. So if you're interested in getting more involved in astrophotography, like a moving train you just jump on start hanging out with these guys and then that's how things happen and the previous meetings again are on our youtube channel so if you want to catch up you can watch they haven't had a meeting since november but uh, the, the past meetings are we always publish the meetings um after the fact on on uh on our youtube channel so this, you're is, interested. this is an old agenda so the two main topics are friends can talk about getting prepared for the solar eclipse oh okay take image in and then we're going to have a kind of open discussion. Rules of thumb how to take images, because some of the new people wondering that, how do I do it? But we got a whole bunch of really good stuff coming in the future as well. Excellent. So, so the agenda for this month, this, this is dated. We're going to talk about the solar eclipse and taking images for the solar eclipse. Those are the two main topics. Okay. And then just general imaging techniques, concepts, more or less? <laughs> for the future? Yeah. For the future. Yeah. Yes. But there's some good stuff coming. Okay, great. This is good. I actually got a DSLR camera for, for Christmas, so I need some help. So I got to get more involved in this group. So, yeah, next uh, Thursday, January the 18th. Okay, Cafe Press. I want to remind you that we have this available to you as well. If you want to sport your MAS swag, you can order anything from ball cups to sweatshirts, T-shirts, golf balls, whatever, with uh, the MAS logo. Designed by Dr. Bustler. And uh, this is a great way to show off. And, uh, 1965. 1965. <laughs> there you go. Right. MAS swag. And we got, got not only MAS, but the, uh, the mass fits as well. So, yeah. So it's, it's a good resource if you're interested. Okay, very interesting article in Sky and Telescope magazine this month for those of you who subscribe to Sky and Telescope. Uh, it's on the solar eclipse that we got coming up in a few months. I just want to mention this. And I would love to pick Bill Wilson's brain about this because I'm still trying to understand the geometry of how eclipses work. There are different types of eclipses. There's ascending node and descending node eclipses. Turns out that the one we've got coming up in April is part of Saros 139. And of course, a Saros is a family of eclipses that happens over about a 13 century period of time, separated by roughly 18 years, a handful of days, and then uh, eight hours. So. If you look here in this article, the one we've got in April is um, the, the next eclipse that occurred after the one that occurred on March 29, 2006. And basically what happens in a serial cycle is the geometry of the eclipse repeats itself every roughly 18 years, half handful of days, and then eight hours. And so now what's interesting is if you have three consecutive serial cycles, you'll see the same eclipse geometry in roughly the same geographical location. So as an example, the one we saw in August 21, 2017, the last solar eclipse was very similar geometrically to the one that was on July 20, 1963, which was just a few months before the Kennedy assassination. Now a little bit further north on the globe. So the upshot of it is, if you're fond of the one in April and you wanna see it again, you, can, you have the opportunity in the year 2078. 
I am getting excited about this. I'll be 104, but it's never too early to start booking your Airbnb. Um, but anyway, the point I wanted to make is uh, the April 8 eclipse occurs the day after true perigee, which is the closest point in the, the moon's orbit to the Earth. So we get a slightly larger disk and slightly longer duration. So the one in August of a few years ago was nice. If you're near the center line for this one, you get almost twice as much duration during totality, but slightly less corona. So there is a trade-off there. So um, the other thing is, if you want a really long duration eclipse, if you go ahead in the Cero cycle for this particular eclipse, it turns out that the best opportunity for the longest duration, when it's closest to perigee, true perigee, in fact, one hour from perigee, occurs in the year 2186. And at that time, you'll see roughly seven minutes and 29 seconds of totality. So that's actually the best eclipse in terms of duration for this particular Saros. So you'll be seeing that one from the other side. But anyway, um, very interesting article on the total eclipse. So I would, I would encourage you to check that out. I've read it once. I need to read it maybe five or six more times. And again, Bill, man, I'd love to sit down and just pick your brain. Either of either bill, the bills. This is one of those articles where you read it and you try to figure it out and you're like, Hey, Bill, what's going on here? You know, how does this ascending node eclipse work, descending? I think a descending node, if it's an odd number Saros, like 139, it's a descending node eclipse, which means that as the moon is moving into the node, it's moving below the plane of the Earth's orbit, I think, but I'm not 100% sure. So anyway, this is one of those things that just kind of, it was an interesting article, so definitely worth checking out. So having said that, we all know April 8 is the uh, the big date, and I just want to say a couple things. So I get a lot of questions. Does MAS have any specific plans? If we're clear, kind of plan A is Camp Kaikima near Hardy, Arkansas. And I've got some flyers on this up here for anybody who's interested. They're hosting a, a three-day event that weekend. It's a, it's a scout camp. <coughs> and again, if we're fortunate enough to have a clear forecast, then we're kind of going to, a bunch of us are going to be flocking to that location. So that's kind of plan A. So if you want to learn more, there's a flyer here. It's the same one here. So, and this is not a bad spot. You're very near the center line and you got about four minutes and nine seconds of duration during totality. And uh, a lot of us are planning to make a day trip out of this. So the idea is get to bed early Sunday night, four or five o'clock in the afternoon, sleep until midnight, get up about one or two, and then take off to whatever spot you're going to be at, see the eclipse, turn around and come back. It's a long day, but you don't have to hassle necessarily with lodging and, and sleep and all that stuff. And you may not get anything right now anyway. And of course, some people don't have to worry about that because they've already got a spot in the path. But we're close enough in Memphis where theoretically we should be able to get there within a day's drive. One question. We get about an, an 86 to a 90% eclipse here in Memphis. Are you, are you aware? Okay. We get about a 94% eclipse here, but here's the thing with solar eclipses, all right? The corona is about as bright as a full moon. The sun's photosphere is a million times brighter than the corona. So even if you're at 99%, you move the decimal places over, the sun is still 10,000 times brighter. Can't see squat. So you've got to be in the path. Even if you're at 99.9%, .9 if you're at 99.9%, .9 that's a good grade if you're in school. But you're still 1,000 times brighter than the corona. So it literally is the difference between day and night. I, so, I, came, I came up with what I think is a pretty good description. And that is the difference between totality and 95% is winning a $2 scratch off ticket versus the billion dollar lottery. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> On a scale of one to 10, it's the difference between a three, a seven and a 10 million. So you're definitely gonna wanna try and make every effort to get into the path of totality. I mean, this is a rare opportunity to be this close, only a two hour drive, two and a half hour drive, whatever it is. When it comes to the path. You take the glasses off and look mm -hmm. with your bare eyes. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. We, we have a, 
It's way, it's way too far. The, the, you know, it's way too far in advance. We may not know literally until just a couple of days before, depending on what the extended forecast is. We, we start paying attention to the weather about two weeks before, and then we go 10 days out, seven days out. And once we get to about three days out, then we'll, we'll more or less know, you know, okay, we're, we're safe to take a shot somewhere in Arkansas. Or it could be the entire state of Arkansas is clouded out. If you want to see it, you got to go to Texas. Or it could be there's a hole somewhere north of uh, Missouri. So three days is about as good as the okay. weather prediction. Can we, all, can we email? Send out an email when it gets close? To the oh, we will. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is real tentative right now. So, again, nothing specific. Very tentative. But if we're fortunate enough to be clear, April 8th last year, 2023, we had nice. We had a nice forecast in Arkansas. So if you were at this location, you would have seen the eclipse in 2023. 2022, it was clouded out. So if you go back the last six or seven years, it's a very inconsistent forecast. April is just that kind of month. So this, this event will be open to all scouts. Is that yes. You got to be a scout to go. No. no. Okay. And again, if they're clear, they'll take anybody. If you have a telescope or if you know anything about eclipses, they'll take you because they're looking for eclipse ambassadors, anybody who can show people the eclipse. So they've essentially given us an open invitation. All we need are clear skies. All we need are clear skies. Famous last words. So that's the trick with these things. You know, it's not only finding the totality path, but also dodging the clouds. So best advice I can say is be flexible. Now, the good news is we got interstate from Little Rock all the way down to Dallas. I-30 takes you to Texarkana, and then you're straight across to Dallas. So that gives you a lot of flexibility in the path to move, uh, assuming that's not all clouded out. So we, you got some good options here, but um, it's kind of scramble mode as we get closer. But we'll, 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 we'll send out more specific information, and we'll kind of keep people in, informed on this. But it's kind of like specific and then flexible at the same time. That's the best I can I can tell you right now. So, but if we're clear, Hardy, Arkansas, four minutes and nine seconds of duration during totality, not a bad spot. Kind of keep that in mind. And again, I got flyers up here for those of you who want to check it out. Um, okay, I got this email also. Tony is uh, Tony Smith. He's one of my peeps from the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. And I met him briefly in Ely, Nevada, when we did the, the broadcast for the annual eclipse. He's actually, he's in the video that's on our YouTube channel for our experience in Ely. He was the guy who had the scale model of the, uh, the Earth and the moon and showing the moon shadows. It was a pretty cool little, little mechanism that he had to show that. But anyway, the upshot of it is they have an eclipse ambassador program with the uh, ASP, Astronomical Society of the Pacific, and NASA, and they're looking for students. Uh, graduate students. So I'm thinking specifically of our professors in the room who teach at uh, the universities here. So, and they're, they're not only looking for graduate students, but ordinary individuals, you know, like us. So anybody who's interested in becoming an Eclipse ambassador, I've got some information up here and I'm thinking of signing up for this. I got to read up on it. And uh, I, I, I do plan to sign up for it. I just haven't gotten to it yet, but um, we do have one member in our club, that's that's an Eclipse ambassador already. He's Morris Butcher. I don't think he's on. Butcher, are you on tonight? Butcher here? Yeah, I don't think he's here. But um, he is an Eclipse ambassador. And basically, this is a program, again, sponsored by ASP and NASA to help communities become aware of and have the resources for the Eclipse. So I've got a couple of flyers here. They're on the table. You can go to their website, eclipseambassadors.org, if you're interested in signing up. And again, if you have students who are interested in this, particularly graduate students, they're, they're looking for more representation, if you will, in the state of Tennessee. So I've got flyers up here. I've got an email sample from Tony. So if anybody's interested in uh, participating or know somebody who might be interested in, in becoming an Eclipse ambassador, uh, check this out at the end of the meeting. So, And again, tonight, if you don't have the Eclipse of glasses already or you need more, we've got them for free. So we got an in-person meeting tonight. February, we're Zoom only. And March is probably our last in-person meeting before the event. But if you come out to our events, 
And of course, we'll be doing more outreach as we get closer. We're giving away free Eclipse glasses. So take as many as you want. We've got plenty of them. And they're probably not going to do us any good. After this eclipse, we've got to wait until August 12, 2045. That's the next one. That's coming soon, so don't be afraid to look here. Y'all can have any I have left over. There you go. So, uh, get your free eclipse glasses. So, anyway, hard to believe we're less than three months away. Time goes just amazing where time goes. I don't know. So, anyway, we'll, uh, we'll continue to keep you all abreast of that as we get closer. So, and with that, we are going to go ahead and jump into our program tonight. I want to welcome back Dr. Bill Bussler to give a very intriguing talk on the star Sirius, as well as a review of stellar evolution. So please help me give a warm welcome to Bill Bussler. Okay. <clears throat> Last time I was here with you all in November, I was pretending to be a historian. And tonight I'm pretending to be an astronomer, which is actually a little easier because I've had more practice at it. So we'll use that expertise tonight to go over some interesting things about Sirius. At least I think they're interesting. Um, according to ancient mythology, uh, the uh, Canis Major constellation was Orion's hunting dog who followed him across the sky. And that was the larger of his two dogs, Canis Minor, with the star Procyon, is uh, the other one of his dogs. The brightest star in Canis Major, Alpha Canis Majoris, using the nomenclature we use for stars, the Greek alphabet in order, followed by the uh, genitive case of the Latin name of the constellation is known as Sirius, and it's also known as the dog star for obvious reasons. It's in the dog constellation. Um, <clears throat> have I already messed up? It's just... Oh, okay, it's doing everything. Okay, all right. Well, uh, most of us know that Sirius is the brightest star in the sky. And uh, it comes from the Greek word uh, serios, which means glowing or a scorcher, which is uh, makes a lot of sense when you put a lot of ignorance of the ancients together with the obvious brilliant star in the sky. It doesn't scorch anything on the earth, but they may have thought it did. And here he is in the sky with the uh, bright star Sirius right there and the other stars that outline his, the dog's body there. Mighty fine pooch indeed. And here it is on the sky map with the Greek letters by each one, except for Alpha, Sirius, Beta, Gamma, Delta, Epsilon. They're not in order of brightness like they're supposed to be here, but more in order of position. Epsilon, for example, it, down here, Adhara, is the brightest second magnitude star. It's like 1.51 1 or something. It just barely missed being a first magnitude star. And it is, if it weren't for Sirius there, that would be the brightest star that we could see in the southeastern part of the sky this time of year. Um, all the pictures except one that I'm showing tonight are taken by members of the Astronomical Society over the years. This was one that I actually took back in 2006. And uh, it shows Orion coming up. Here's stars in his belt and Betelgeuse and Rigel, the red <laughs> supergiant, blue giant, Castor and Pollux and Gemini. And here is Procyon, the other dog. And coming up over the trees is Sirius, the dog star. Notice how Orion's belt just points right to it. In case you need any verification that that's the brightest star in the sky, Sirius. But it does follow like that. Notice that uh, this makes up the winter triangle, Sirius, Procyon, and Betelgeuse, which is actually a better triangle than the summer triangle in symmetry. Uh, the heliacal rising, which means it rises just before sunrise, occurs in August. And we've seen that a number of times watching Perseid meteors, that when we're out all night long, just before the sun comes up and you can't see any more meteors, you'll see Sirius popping up over the southeastern horizon. 
And it's always in the Northern Hemisphere, pretty well hot in that time of year. And it's become known as the dog days of summer because of the heliacal rising that Sirius and the sun pretty much move across the sky together. And it was thought that its heat and light were added to that of the sun, causing the extra hotness then. Uh, of course, we know a little more than that now, but that's, that's part of the story. We even blame the appearance of rabid dogs on the uh, Sirius being in line with the sun. The uses up here at the top. The ancient Egyptians associated the heliacal rising of Sirius with the uh, impending flooding of the Nile, after which they could plant their crops. So they used that as a sign to know when to get their fields in a row and get ready to do the planting. And Fiji Islanders, uh, who live at 17 degrees south latitude, uh, used it for navigation over the open sea. They were able to measure angles closely enough to tell when they were, because their latitude is 17 degrees and the declination or distance of Sirius from the celestial equator is 17 degrees to the south. So when it was passing overhead, they knew they were right in line with the Fiji Islands. They could have been a thousand miles off east or west, but they at least were on the right track to run into the islands when they would head in that direction. Uh, they could determine their latitude from it, and when it was near the horizon, they used it to determine their directions because it's so bright that even on a hazy evening out over the ocean, you could still see uh, where it was, and that would give them their directions when they, because they all knew all this kind of stuff then. Here's a, an unexplained thing, at least temporarily unexplained. There was a tribe in Western Africa in Mali known as the Dogon, who uh, was discovered in a, by an explorer, Marcel Griol, in 1933 to have somehow learned that Sirius had an unseen companion which revolved around it in a 50-year period. Now, that's kind of information that's a little hard to come by, and I'm going to spend a good deal of time this evening going over how we know that. Now, how did they know that? Well... Alien visitation? Sure, why not? That's as good a reason as any. <laughs> it turns out there had been a French eclipse expedition to Mali in 1893, 40 years before, and surely some of them were talking about astronomy in general and Sirius in particular, and it was known by then that Sirius did have that companion that orbited it in a 50-year period, so some of that uh, somehow got out to them, and they remembered that and not necessarily where they got it from. Who knows over in Arkansas after the eclipse this year, what sort of things we might pass on that they might remember 40 years from now, but forget who it was that told them. So, <laughs> Okay, uh, Ptolemy uh, used Sirius to mark the central meridian of his star maps. You know, you've got to have some kind of starting point to measure your way. We have the prime meridian on Earth, Greenwich, and we have markers in the sky, too, that we use. But Ptolemy used uh, Sirius to mark the central meridian and measure everything east or west from that. And here's where it gets weird. He referred to it as one of six red stars. <laughs> <laughs> Something doesn't add up there. The other five he mentioned, uh, not all particularly red. Uh, Pollux and uh, Arcturus are definitely yellowish or yellowish orange. And Aldebaran is borderline red orange. Uh, and and Teres and Betelgeuse are full out red. So they're in there. But that makes it even worse because he knew what a red star looked like. And he said Sirius was. Well, all of those are spectral class M or K, which M is red and K is the orange. Uh, is it possible that Ptolemy made a mistake? Well, he wrote the manual on astrology that's still been used by astrologers today, so this yeah. wouldn't be his only mistake. <laughs> <laughs> and on top of that, other people, whoops, probably made the uh, same mistake. Uh, Eratos, a uh, Greek poet, uh, in his book Phenomena, describes Sirius as red. 
But come on, I mean, he was a poet, not an astronomer. So you got, they t- look at things a little differently. Just give him a little leeway there. Uh, <clears throat> Seneca, a historian, describes Sirius as being a deeper red than Mars. Now, that's a little weird, too. And others saw it as sea blue. And the Chinese used it as the standard for white stars. So there's some discussion. Either Sirius has done some very strange things over the years, or our perception or descriptions of color have. Which one might be easier to explain? We still uh, do this kind of thing uh, uh, with colors. We'll see that in a second. Is it possible that Sirius once really was red and has changed the color to blue-white over the past 2,000 years? You want the short answer? (laughs) Okay. It hasn't done that, and we'll spend a fair amount of time this evening showing why not. The modern theories completely rule out Sirius as ever being red during all of human history, and we'll have the details later. The ancient Greeks did a strange thing with colors. <clears throat> they would use uh, circumstances and significance to describe colors way more than what we would use as a, a, a color chart with all the colors specifically indicated on it. Uh, Homer described the wine dark sea and in the Odyssey and in the Iliad, he was talking about when somebody got stabbed, the blood would rush out green, meaning fresh, but not necessarily what we would think green would mean. Uh, And also on top of that, when Sirius is near the horizon, it flashes all different colors because as we know that stars are point sources of light, don't show a disc. So when that one ray of light from Sirius enters your eye, it has encountered a lot of obstacles on the way, Uh, dust particles and uh, dew drops and reindeer fur and who knows what all has happened <laughs> as it comes through the air. And it used to be I was listed for the library and the newspapers as a resource and I would get calls a lot this time of year. That there's this flying saucer out there and it's changing colors. And I said, is it over in the southeast? And I, I don't know my directions. And I said, well, you figure that out and call me back and we'll take it from there. And Never did. Back to the fact that it's the brightest star in the sky, magnitude minus 1.46. A few, two two or three stars are bright enough to go uh, negative in their uh, magnitude nomenclature. It's nearly twice as bright as Canopus, the second brightest star, minus 0.72. How many of you all have seen Canopus? Not a whole lot. You can actually see it from here. It gets a couple of degrees above the horizon, usually in February. It's about the time. If you want to see it, uh, you need to wait until Orion and Sirius are straddling the meridian. And you've got a good view to the south, like down a country road without a lot of traffic. And you get out there and you stand on tiptoe, and then you'll see Canopus just right on the horizon. And you'd be amazed at how bright it is for a star that close to the horizon. And it's right ascension, that is the distance uh, east of the measuring point, which is now the vernal equinox, not Sirius itself, or it would be zero. Its right ascension is six hours and 45 minutes, which is a fourth of the way around the sky east from where the celestial equator and the ecliptic cross and on the first day of spring. So that's the point we use to measure now. And its declination, as we see, is minus 17, like the same as the Fiji Islanders counted on. Okay. Is it bright because it's very luminous intrinsically or because it's close? Short answer? Yeah, Yeah, it's both of those things. So we'll go over how we know each one of those, and that explains why it's so bright. Its luminosity is 25 times that of the sun. Uh, you remember what luminosity means. It's the amount of light output that a star has compared to how much the sun puts out intrinsically, not how it looks in the sky necessarily. And Sirius is 25 times as bright as the sun. 
It's not the champion by any means. Blue giant stars like Rogel and Orion's heel can be up to 60,000 times as luminous as the sun. You better be glad it's 600 light years away or you get a UV sunburn at night going outside with all that heat and light coming to you. It would be the scorcher. It's only 8.60 light years away, which makes it the fifth closest star to our solar system. <clears throat> but, uh, yeah, I'll get into the, the order in just a moment. Surface temperature, 9940 degrees Kelvin, quite a bit hotter than the sun. And we'll get into how we know that after a little bit as well. Spectral class, A1V, the uh, A is the designation for all of the white stars. And the one is a subdivision and the V is a sub subdivision. It's radial velocity, minus 5.50 kilometers per second. In other words, it's approaching us at about uh, three or 4,000 miles an hour. So it's coming towards us at what seems like a pretty good clip, nowhere near the speed of light or anything, but it is moving towards us. It's absolute magnitude. Now, we haven't covered that term in a while. It's the distance, it's the, the uh, brightness a star would have if we put it at a standard distance. You know, in order to sort out whether stars look bright because they're close or because they're intrinsically bright, we could, in our imagination, put them all at the same distance. And uh, that imaginary distance is the 32.61 light years. And we'll see why we use that after a little bit. But if we could push Sirius out from its distance of eight light years out to 32, it would dim down, of course, to 1.42. It would still be a first magnitude star about the same brightness as Regulus in Leo. So that would be what it would, absolute magnitude would look like. It's heavier than the sun, 2.02 .02 solar masses. <clears throat> and its apparent diameter is 5.9 milli arc seconds. Now, how do we measure that? I just got through telling you that stars are point sources, and no matter how big a telescope you use, it's never going to look like anything more than a point, unless there's something wrong with your optics or your eyes. So one or the other, it's got to look like a point. Well, we can do this now. This is something fairly new. There's a thing called the uh, center for high, high angular resolution astronomy built on Mount Wilson. And they got six 40 inch telescopes, which is pretty good. I mean, the 40 inch telescope is twice as big as Jeremy's water heater that you've probably all looked through. So they've got six of those spread along a distance of a thousand feet to make an interferometer. Uh, and with that, you know, Michelson's interferometer is also there on Mount Wilson, the original one. But uh, this is, amplifies that way more than what he had with a little uh, device that puts all the beams from the different telescopes together and analyzes them to get the angular separation of one side to the other of something in the sky. And it has a resolution of 200 micro arc seconds, which is well within what the diameter of Sirius appears to it. So we can measure this kind of thing directly now. That doesn't have to be any sort of weird hocus pocus. <clears throat> the um, diameter is one and a half million miles, which as you know is quite a bit bigger than the sun or 1.7 times the diameter of our sun. So it's a good sized star. It's surface gravity. Remember, on the Earth, the acceleration due to gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared, or 32 feet per second squared. On Sirius, it's 21,400, or about uh, a little over 2,000 times as strong. So it wouldn't be a good place to take a stroll. <clears throat> Proper motion. And this is one of the most surprising things to me when I was looking up everything. It moves in right ascension at minus 546 milli arc seconds per year. <clears throat> and right ascension minus means it's moving towards the west. So it's going westward at 546 milli arc seconds per year. 
and it's going south in declination, more than one second of arc per year. A thousand milli arc seconds is a second, so it's going a second of arc per year towards the south. Uh, we'll see a little bit about how we learned that. That's kind of fascinating. Uh, it doesn't have any planets, at least not any four times the mass of Jupiter. Its rotation is fairly slow, uh, 16 kilometers per second on its surface at the equator. So there's very little flattening involved because it's not spinning that fast. Uh, other stars like Vega really whip around 274 kilometers per second. And it moves so fast that it squashes itself out. It kind of looks like uh, in images I've seen, again, by interferometry, it looks kind of like a ball of dough sitting on the countertop that's flattened itself out under its own weight. It's about that kind of shape. Our sun is relatively leisurely too, <clears throat> 2.1 kilometers per second. Well, you know, it takes nearly a month to make a complete rotation, so... Uh, it's moving rather slowly and it's hardly flattened at all. But what other solar system object are we familiar with? It is flattened and easily noticed through even a small telescope. We look at it all the time. Yeah, Jupiter. It's rotating at 12.3 kilometers per second. So it's uh, comparable to the rotation of Sirius. So, But it's, it's uh, softer <clears throat> and it's, so it's more flattened. It's age, now we start getting into things that have a pretty big error bar on them, <clears throat> 230 million years, or somewhere between 225 and 250 million years. And its lifetime is uh, going to be overall, overall about 800 million years. You can see it's not but about a fourth of the way through that now because it goes for 800 and it's been around for 230 or so. Okay, a little bit about the magnitudes first. Sirius, magnitude 1.46, nearly twice as bright as Canopus. Okay, each stellar magnitude differs from the next by a factor of about 2.5. Remember who set up that scale of the magnitudes? Our friend Hipparchus, who apparently taught right here even before <laughs> I started. He set up the magnitude scale where the first magnitude stars were about a hundred times as bright as the six. So each one was about two and a half times as bright. Two and a half to the fifth power for that many intervals is just below a hundred. But people not willing to leave things well enough alone decided to make that first to six exactly a hundred. So now it's 2.5119 instead of 2.5. You won't see that going outside and looking at the sky. Okay. So uh, comparing Sirius and Canopus, I'll remember the 2.5 2 is the base of this uh, exponential term, and we put the difference of the magnitudes in there, and we calculate that as 1.97. Well, it says nearly twice as bright, and it is. Fifth closest star after Alpha Centauri and three red dwarfs. Think about the significance of that. What do you have to do to see Alpha Centauri? It's best to go to the southern hemisphere, but you can actually see it low along the horizon in Miami, which I've done, and then did it right and saw it from Australia. Okay, so you don't walk outdoors and see Alpha Centauri. What about the three red dwarfs? Sounds like a fairy tale. Uh, the three red dwarfs you're not going to see without a telescope. So what does that mean? that Sirius is not only the brightest star, but it's the nearest star that you can see just going outside and looking up without a telescope. The brightest and nearest. Okay, how do we know that? How do we know what its distance is or any star's distance? Well, as the Earth goes around the sun, it's the, the diameter of its orbit is twice the distance from the Earth to the sun, two astronomical units, or 186 million miles. And that causes the nearer stars to exhibit parallax. That is, they seem to move back and forth as the Earth is moving around the sun. Just a little bit. You can simulate that you know, without any equipment at all. Just hold your finger near your nose and alternate blinking one eye and the other, and your finger seems to jump back and forth quite a bit. But if you move your arm out at arm's length, 
then it still moves back and forth, but not as much. So the greater distance means there's less parallax or that jumping back and forth. <clears throat> and through <clears throat> trigonometry, such as you would learn in high school, nothing fancy here, we can calculate the distances, just triangulation to the nearest stars, those within a few hundred light years of the solar system. Beyond that, it gets where it's really hard to measure the angles. Here's a diagram of all of this. We see the Earth in its orbit around the sun, and here's a relatively near star that has a fairly big parallax angle, and one that's farther away has a smaller parallax angle. And quantitatively, we uh, use the distance across the Earth's orbit, like six months apart, and we measure the star at both uh, positions against the distant background stars, and that gives us our parallax angle. With a baseline of 186 million miles, we usually use half of that, so we want a right triangle, so all our trig formulas work. Drawing's not to scale. Kind of looks like a big angle in there, but the even the nearest stars like Alpha Centauri don't even have one second of parallax. 36 hundredth of a degree, none of them have that much. Aristotle had the solar system pretty well figured out. He said that, that he was just convinced that the Earth moved around the sun, but he couldn't observe any stellar parallax that he was looking for like this. So he said, that can't be it. It's got to be something else. But what he didn't realize was his, the, the measurements he'd have to make would have to wait for a long time before we had the ability to measure a parallax of less than a second of arc for the nearest stars. So he was on the right track, but his data let him down. Okay. Suppose a star is at a distance such that the parallax is one second. That would be something a little closer than Alpha Centauri, wouldn't it? Because I said it was didn't even have one second. If you figure that out, well, first of all, we name it one of these ugly names astronomers come up with, like quasar, parsec from the parallax second, the star that uh, the distance that corresponds to a parallax of one second is a parsec, and it's uh, we can figure out what that is uh, just substituting into the formula for the tangent. The opposite side is the radius of the Earth's orbit. And we're talking about one second of arc, 93 million miles. And we solve for the distance there. And it's 19.2 trillion miles, which works out to 3.261 light years, which is one parsec. And since there aren't any stars that close, it'd be silly to use that as a standard distance for absolute magnitudes when there aren't any that close. So they arbitrarily decided on 10 parsecs or 32.61 light years, which I showed you a little while ago. That's where that comes from is 10 parsecs. Thomas Henderson, uh, that was when he did this. That's not his lifespan or that would be extraordinary. <laughs> he measured the parallax of Sirius is 0.23 second uh, plus or minus 0.25. You know, it's kind of a, a big error bar there. <laughs> Giving a distance of the reciprocal of that, 4.3 parsecs or 13.9 light years. Now that's kind of far off if it's 8.6, but considering this was the first measurement well before photography, and that's uh, pretty good. Modern measurement shows the parallax of 379 or 0.379 seconds, and that gives the distance of 8.60 that we were uh, talking about before, that is actual distance now, with a lot smaller error, 0.04 light years. <clears throat> how do we determine the absolute magnitude? Well, I told you what it was for Sirius, but how do we calculate that once we know its visual magnitude and its distance. Those are the two things we have to know. And that's the formula we use. The absolute magnitude is equal to the visual magnitude plus this correction factor. That 2.5119 should look familiar, the base of the log term. These are already log terms, so we don't have to take the log of it. And this is the ratio of the distances, the 10 parsecs to the star's distance. And it's squared, and the distance is in the denominator. 
Well, what does that mean? This is the inverse square law, isn't it? If you put a star twice as far away, it'll be one fourth as bright, three times as far away, one ninth as bright. So the, that's why it's in the denominator and that's why it's squared. And if we use some examples here for uh, Sirius, 8.60 light years, and it's visual magnitude minus 1.46. We go through the steps and we get the 1.45 that I showed you a little while ago. It's about the same as what Regulus is in the sky. And that's how we do that. Surface temperature, 99.9940 degrees Kelvin. Now that seems like the trickiest kind of thing to do. We can't send a space probe to Sirius with a big thermometer on it that won't melt at that temperature. So this is some of the smoothest things that you can see in physics and astronomy. Stars, as you know, emit all the colors of the rainbow. And if you put the a light from a star through a prism, they'll be separated out. And the visible part of the spectrum that we can see runs from about 400 near in the purple end of the spectrum up to 700, the deep red part of the spectrum. All the rest of it, we can't see one way or another. This is a tiny fraction of the whole electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, yes. So I have a, a Kelvin temperature, or a Kelvin question. Mm -hmm. That 9,000 and change, would that be based on the whiteness of it? Because in um, lighting, you know, something around 2,000, that's kind of a warm. Okay. Uh, all right. But the, that, that's the a good question. I will have. Yeah. Whiter and whiter. Yeah. I'll have a. Uh, some slides illustrating that, and I'll bring up your color temperature of fluorescent light bulbs yeah. and things like that. That's a whole different thing. That's faked temperature. Okay. You know they're not 9,000 Kelvin inside of that tube. So, so they make it look like that with yeah. uh, different phosphors and filters and things. This is actually things. temperature temperature. This is the actual real temperature. Okay. Um, Max Planck, one of the great genius physicists of the 20th century, he derived an equation which showed the intensity of the light that a star or any glowing object puts out as a function of its temperature. We all know that the hotter you get things, the more the color shifts to white and then blue, and the cooler, like a piece of charcoal just glowing barely is red. We know about that already, but he wrote an equation that showed that if you took the spectrum of an object, it doesn't put out the same amount of energy all across the spectrum, but it comes to a peak and then goes back down on the other side of it. And this is the equation. Uh, this is a complicated function of the wavelength and temperature. This is the intensity that the star puts out as a function of wavelength, like you, uh, select a temperature, put in a wavelength, and then you can calculate how intense the light is at that point. The wavelength is in here to the fifth power down here, and it's in the exponent up here. And the temperature appears in one place in the denominator of the exponent in the denominator. So it's a complicated equation, but it's fairly easy to do if you write a spreadsheet. You could just select a temperature, put that in, and then put in a variety of, of, of wavelengths, and then you could get a graph of that. Why don't we do that? It's 6,000, we put in the temperature of 6,000, calculated at every one of these points across here, and the visible spectrum is what? 400 to 700, so this is in the visible part of the spectrum. It's 6,000 degrees Kelvin. The peak is in the visible part of the spectrum, and it falls off to either side from there. So there is a peak. Here's the one at 10,000. You'd expect the peak to be shorter because it'd be bluer. In fact, it's so much shorter that it's actually in the ultraviolet up here, around 300 uh, nanometers or 3,000 angstroms if you use the old system. So you can put this in, have all kinds of fun playing with the, what the spectrum looks like for any temperature star. After doing this for a while, Wilhelm Wien discovered that all stars have the maximum wavelength, and it depends on the temperature. 
I already just said that, but he's the one who came up with it first. <laughs> <clears throat> and the hotter the object, the shorter the maximum wavelength. And here's uh, a couple of ones I've already shown you and uh, another one besides. At 4,500 degrees Kelvin, we see that it has a peak uh, just at the very end of the red part of the spectrum, bordering on the infrared there. And the one at 6,000 I showed you was right in the middle, kind of yellow, almost on the green side. And at 7,500, it's uh, over there and just about ultraviolet. I showed you one that was 10,000 and it was clearly in the ultraviolet. So you need to uh, observe two things about this. One, I should have told you already, but this is uh, the first important thing. Whenever you increase the temperature on a glowing object, it puts out more energy at all wavelengths. These lines never cross. The, the more energy you have, or the more temperature you have, the more light or whatever form of energy it puts out at every wavelength across the spectrum. So that's important. And if you were really looking close, you might have already noticed that back here. Okay, those look like they're about the same height, right? Pretty much. But look at the units along the side there. These are in 10 to the 13th exponents, just barely reach 10 to the 14th up here at 6,000. If we switch to 10,000, and it starts out at 10 to the 14th and gets well into the 10 to the 15th up there. So it's this whole peak is way bigger and taller than the previous one. And okay. The second thing is, is what the Wien's law is known about, the displacement law, that the higher the temperature, the shorter the wavelength of each one. Longer wavelength, medium, and shorter wa wavelength over here. So those are the two main things to get from that graph. Now, when a scientist gets a table of data, let's just hold off a second before we look, jump to the conclusion there. When you get a table of data and you've got one column and all the numbers are going up, like the temperature, and you've got another column when all the numbers are going down, like the wavelength of the peak, What's the first thing you'd try to do? See if, see if maybe multiplying together would give you a constant. Like if you had eight and one and four and two and two and four and one and eight, all of those give you eight when you multiply them together. As one row goes down, the other row goes up, but the product stays the same. And he did that with his table of data and discovered that if you took the maximum wavelength times the Kelvin temperature and multiplied them together, you always get this number. Isn't that something? So that means all you have to know is one of these and you can get the other. Well, which one's easier to do? Send a temperature probe or what? You actually just measure the, you take a spectrum, which is pretty easy, see where the maximum wavelength is and substitute it into that equation. And you can calculate its temperature if you know the, where the peak of the spectrum is. For the sun. 502.20 nanometers is the peak. So you substitute that into here, solve for T, and get 5770 Kelvin. 5500 Celsius, as you get higher and higher and higher, that 273 degrees makes less and less difference. So I'll put it in for this one, and I don't do it all the time. Um, what's another star we ought to look at? Sirius. <laughs> <laughs> Sirius, yeah. Its uh, peak wavelength is 291 nanometers. So you substitute that in and you get the 9940, which we've seen before, much hotter with the shorter wavelength. Now, Bill, what you were asking about was uh, you see a color temperature of other light sources like headlights or fluorescent lights. That in no way means that this applies. Uh, this applies to an actual glowing object that as you vary its temperature, it puts out a complete spectrum that has the peak wavelength and a, a certain temperature. That's not the way those work. They have color filters in inside there that and different phosphors and fluorescent lights that put out something that's equivalent to a star that's at 2000 degrees Kelvin. 
So, but it's not 2000. Okay. This is called black body radiation. Black body radiation. If you, it's a, okay. A lot of people haven't had a lot of things like that, but that's what we call it. <laughs> okay. Spectral class A1, B. A for white. And uh, long about 1910, two astronomers in different countries, Einar Hertzsprung, and Henry Norris Russell in here, Princeton, tried to see if there was some kind of relationship between the absolute magnitude or luminosity, how intrinsically bright a star was with its spectral type or temperature. And they worked independently. And in this picture, the two interesting things, I've shown them facing away from each other to show that they were working independently. Wasn't that, wasn't that? <laughs> And the second thing is, they were both still alive when I joined the Astronomical Society. <laughs> They're still writing papers, at least Hertzsprung was. <laughs> okay, they plotted the spectral type O through M. Do you know about the different spectral types? The, uh, along the x-axis, decreasing temperature. On the y-axis, they plotted the either absolute magnitude or luminosity, the brightest ones near the top. And they found that 90% of stars fit along a band diagonally across the, uh, the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, from upper left to lower right, from hot and luminous to cool and dim. Now, this uh, band right here, the, the one thing wrong with this picture is it makes it look like they're kind of evenly scattered, doesn't it? Just make it uh, just in your mind, put in 90% of the stars are right in this band here, and these are outliers here. The spectral class, O, B, A, fine girl, kiss, B. That's a, in case you're worried, that wasn't what I was going to ask you to help me with. <laughs> <laughs> so this is uh, the spectral classification, which is the same as the temperature, and we can overlook the B minus V index for now. And on the right side, we see the luminosity, the brightness compared to the sun. Here's the sun, of course, with a luminosity of one, as you'd expect. Its absolute magnitude is 4.84, so it's right in, in that range right there. And we go down to 10,000th of the luminosity to 10,000 times. So that, and Rigel is up even higher than that. So it's a big range, and, but most of the stars are along that main sequence. Now, why do they call it the main sequence? Well, that's a mistake. That implies what they thought, but they made a mistake there. They thought stars evolved in that direction from upper left to lower right along the um, Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. Uh, of course, now we know they don't do that, and we'll go over all of that a little bit later, but they, we still call it the main sequence, even though there's no evolution along that direction. They also found lesser concentration of stars in the upper right corner and lower left corner. How can a star be low temperature over here, but very luminous up here? Well, each square inch of its surface doesn't put out a whole lot of light, but it's got a whole lot of square inches if it's expanded to be hundreds of times bigger than the sun. So these are extremely big stars, even though they're cool and red, which is why they're called red giants or red supergiants. And by the same line of reasoning, the ones down near the lower left are uh, very small because how else could you explain they could be as hot as they are, as hot as Sirius, but only 10,000 as bright as the sun. So that's the reason they've got a small surface area. Well, there's an interesting story in all of this, which we will take a look at uh, very shortly. I think I hit the wrong direction on that on the left side. Oh, yeah, a few more. I left out a few across the top and down the left side. Yeah, there are a few, and they because I, you know, there are hardly any on here. There's some across the top that we'll see about later on, and some more down the left side. So the story of all of those put together, we'll do right after we take a brief intermission. Okay, so. Okay.
Anybody wants to take a bio break or do you five, ten minute break and we'll do the second part of the notes. Okay. okay, I don't have a horn to blow or anything like that, but uh, we'll go ahead and kick off part two here. It's about 45 minutes. Okay, I'll, and then, uh, I'll be well, done I'll by 9 o'clock come hell or high water. No, no, no. Okay. Okay. All right, part two. Okay. The radial velocity part, I gave you that. This, so this is the whole list of facts I gave you at first, and then we're going over some of the ways we know those things, so it isn't just like reading out of the phone book. This way you know how we know these things. When you read articles about it, it makes a lot more sense that way. William Huggins, uh, well, he could be a whole topic in himself, uh, measured the radial velocity of Sirius as 40 kilometers per second receding from us. <laughs> Of course, that was off a little bit because it's actually approaching at uh, 5.50 kilometers per second. So, it, but again, this was uh, just after the photography was getting going and the plates were soggy uh, slabs of glass with goo dripping off of them. And so, wonder they were able to measure anything off of that. So, but at least he's the one that kicked it off. And so that means that Sirius will actually be getting brighter over the next 60,000 years. If you want to keep records and things, you can do that. Okay. Everybody knows about the Doppler effect with respect to sound. Everybody knows that, that uh, if a car is sitting still and you press down on the horn, you'll get a certain note out of it. Uh, if some guy is chasing you on the interstate, honking his horn, is he coming up to you, the pitch of that horn will be higher. And after he goes around you, waving a cheery greeting to you and speeds off into the distance, the pitch of the sound will get lower. Now, sound waves and light waves are quite different. Sound waves, for one thing, require a medium like air to go through, and they have a, a, a longitudinal uh, dimension to them. That is the compression and rarefaction of the air that makes the sound waves vibrate is along the same direction that the sound wave is traveling. And uh, the closer they're bunched together, the faster your eardrum vibrates and your auditory nerve and brain put that together as a higher pitch. And if something is uh, putting out a lower frequency signal and the uh, bunches and compressions are farther apart, your eardrum will vibrate more slowly and your brain picks that up as a low pitch sound. It works the same way in light waves, except light, as we see, is got a transverse component. The rising and falling of its intensity is at right angles to the direction of the motion of the beam of light. Suppose we have a star that's just sitting there, a yellow star like the sun or Capella, and it's not moving one way or the other. If we look at it, it will look yellow. No big surprise. Because the light uh, waves are coming out and reaching our eye the same way they were emitted. If a star, a yellow star again, is moving towards us, though, its light waves will be bunched closer together. And that, when that hits your retina, and picked up by your optic nerve and then processed by your brain, it you see that as a higher frequency, like a higher pitch sound, it's a higher pitch light. So it would be shifted towards the blue end of the spectrum if something is moving towards us. Uh, if we are, if something is receding from us though, and sort of throwing its light over its shoulder back to us as it's speeding off in the distance. Its light waves will be stretched out, so when they hit your eye apparatus, we see fewer vibrations or waves per second, and we perceive that as a redder color of light. And if it's actually receding fast enough, it'll actually look red. So that just says that again. And not only is the maximum wavelength that we were talking about a while ago shifted uh, towards the blue or red end of the spectrum, depending on whether something's moving towards us or away from us, but every spectral line also is. Now, we're not going to talk about lines in the spectrum tonight. That's another whole subject in itself. 
But suffice it to say that if you use a high enough resolution spectrometer, you will see lines in the spectrum that are caused by electrons either jumping from a lower to a higher uh, energy shell, energy level in an atom, or falling down to a lower one, which will either absorb or emit light from the background and cause a dark line or a bright line to appear. So those are all shifted as well. And once again, it's quantitative in an amazingly simple way. Remar remarkably simple equation. I have. If you measure how much the light is shifted towards the red or blue by virtue of its motion compared to what the wavelength is supposed to be with the thing just sitting there in the laboratory. That ratio is exactly the same ratio as the ratio of its speed to the speed of light. So that's a, a remarkably useful thing to, uh, to know about. So we can measure the shift of the light, compare it to its rest wavelength, multiply that by the speed of light, and that will give us the velocity of the object whether it's, and whether it's moving towards us or away from us. Let's look at this for Sirius again. The hydrogen alpha spectral line, many of you have hydrogen alpha equipment for looking at the sun. The hydrogen alpha line occurs when an electron in the third energy shell of hydrogen falls to the second shell. And that puts out just enough energy that translates into what we perceive as red light. There's a lot more to it than that, but that's what we got time for. So the third to the second shell gives us this deep red light. Um, and that same line, well, this, this one was in the, whoops, this one was in the lab. It gives you that amount. <laughs> On Sirius, it's actually shifted a little bit out here. You can imagine Huggins with his wet plates trying to measure something like that, because here's where the answer is out here, not in the easy part over here. So he was able to, uh, well, now we're able to measure this quite accurately. And we get the difference between these two right here, divided by the rest wavelength, gives us this over this times the speed of light and minus 5.48 kilometers per second. So that's how we know that Sirius is moving towards us at 5.48 kilometers per second. Okay, the proper motion, and this is extraordinary, I think. We already saw this little bit of information before, but how do we know that? Well, it took two astronomers working 1,800 years apart to come up with this. The first one uh, was not Edmund Halley. He was the one who measured it according to Ptolemy's position. He's the first one. I already had a picture of him, so I'm not going to put him back in again. Sirius had moved 30 arc minutes southward in 1800 compared to what it was in Ptolemy's charts. 30 arc minutes. Okay. Uh, Turn that to seconds, 36 uh, times 60 is 1,800 uh, seconds. In 1,800 years, that's right out one second per year, isn't it? Yeah, one second per year. What do we know that's 30 arc minutes in size? The moon and the sun, they're 30 minutes. This has moved the moon's diameter southward in 1,800 years. So... If you're looking for things that Sirius has done weird in the last uh, number of centuries, well, this is one of them. That was just moving. We'll see later about the color, but the moving is, is phenomenal. And the modern values for it are actually even worse. It moves 1.2 seconds south a year and five and now half a second uh, westward. So it's, it moves uh, noticeably uh, over a period of time. Okay, in 1844, Friedrich Wilhelm Bessel, who you might figure has got to be the great, 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 great grandfather of Johnny Cash. <laughs> <laughs> it, this is a remarkable sentence. He noticed, he noticed that the proper motion of Sirius wobbled. Now that takes something, isn't it? It's, this thing is moving across the sky where it's moved the diameter of the moon in 1,800 years, but he noticed that that path had wobbled, and he attributed it to an unseen companion. 
So this was a smart cookie. Uh, he had already come up with the Bessel function that those of you who are in advanced mathematics would know about, but uh, waves coming from the center propagating and so on. This is almost like a diversion for him to just start measuring stars and figuring things out. And he did. He was the measured the proper motion of Sirius. Well, not everybody jumped right on it. It took a while, like nearly 20 years later, for Alvin Clark, who's famous for making all the big telescope lenses in the world. He's, uh, at the time, he made an 18.5-inch refractor for Dearborn Observatory, and at the time, that was the biggest one in the world, and he surpassed that several times. I've looked through one of them at uh, Allegheny Observatory in Pittsburgh and saw Pluto through it, and it was just wonderful image. He's, he was the best. Um, and he observed a faint companion, Sirius B. And it was a visual magnitude of 8.44, which isn't particularly faint, but nobody had ever seen it before because you know so close to Sirius, the glare would uh, be an impediment. It became known as the pup, naturally, from the dog star and the pup. Uh, and this, my friends, is the only picture I'm showing you tonight that was not taken by a member of the Astronomical Society. And it's at an optimum position this year to take. So astrophotographers unite and see what you can come up with. So if I ever do this again, I'll have 100% MAS photographs to show. Its surface temperature, a lot hotter than Sirius, 25,200. And now you know how we get that. So that's not a mystery number anymore. Spectral class DA2. The A again is the white classification, and D stands for dwarfs. So it's a white dwarf star. Absolute magnitude 11.18. So that's uh, it's pretty faint if you put it out at. 32 light years. And its luminosity is only five or six percent as much as the sun. So it's truly dim because it's small. It's hot, but small. And it's fairly uh, light too compared to Sirius A, which remember is two solar masses. This is a little bit less than one solar mass. And its diameter, which you can get from the Hubble directly, 7,500 miles. Don't need the interferometry. Uh, did the Hubble get that close to Sirius for it to get a good picture of it? No, it's in Earth orbit, but it's above the Earth's atmosphere. That's what makes all the difference. You can, no glare, no uh, jumping around, no flashing colors or anything like that. So they're able to do that. And its surface gravity compared to the Earth's is like uh, 370,000 times as strong as the 9.8 meters per second, which will break anything you drop, especially the more expensive it is. <laughs> In another 2 billion years, it'll be a black dwarf, but it, why does it take that long? Well, it doesn't have a very big surface area to get rid of the heat out of. It's just hot, and it stays that way for another 2 billion years, and none of them have done that yet. Uh, there aren't any. The orbital period of the system, 50.090 years. Any Dogon tri tribesmen would know that. <laughs> and the separation between the two varies, and this is visually, between 3 and 11 arc seconds, which normally would not be a challenge if it weren't for the glare from Sirius. Uh, at a, when they're at minimum, it takes about a 12-inch telescope to get them far apart. You get Sirius out of the field of view, and then you can see the pup pretty good after that. And the last, and I've, it, when it was farthest apart, I've seen them with my four and a quarter inch Palomar Junior scope, so it doesn't take a big scope to see it. The last uh, minimum separation, the periapsis, was in 1994, and the apoapsis maximum was in 2019, but that's the true uh, separation, and uh, it's still, you know, only five years after that, and out of 50-year orbit, it is still an optimum position for taking a picture of. So, okay. the actual separation is average 19.6 astronomical units about the distance from the sun to Uranus. 
And the true separation varies between 8.2 and 31.5 astronomical units or 760 million to 2.9 billion miles. It's a pretty good separation. And here's a picture of it. The one on the left shows it face on. And we've got Sirius holding still and the B star going around it. But uh, it's not that way at all. You know, they both move. But because that's what Bessel saw was that Sirius was moving. He, he was looking at the big one. And he uh, and, and we uh, see the years along there. And it's we can see that around over here, it's getting to be a maximum separation. We don't look at it face on. We're kind of looking at it at an underneath angle. So it actually goes around this way. And uh, it looks way more elliptical than this. So, and here we are over here. The last apoapsis was in 2019. So we're down here a couple of notches. But you can see it's still almost a maximum distance from Sirius right there. Okay. How do we get the masses? Yes, do you, do you what's a, closest can we still detect it with relatively small telescopes from the Earth? Oh, I'd say within 10 years, you ought to be able to see it with a six inch or something like that. So, yeah. Because I, when I saw it with my four and a quarter, it wasn't at the minimum separation, but it was easily seen. And it uh, certainly wasn't at the maximum either. Uh, Kepler's laws of planetary motion. Uh, one link between November's talk and this one is most of what I learned about astronomy, or at least how to study astronomy, I got from those early pioneers of the Astronomical Society, uh, mostly Michael Snowden, who would give a talk way longer than this every time at a meeting or after the meeting to stay around and go through Duncan's astronomy book. So uh, this um, thanking him for this. Uh, you all familiar with the three Kepler laws, planetary motion? Some, yes, some, okay. First one is that all of the planets' orbits around the sun are ellipses, and the sun's at one focus of the ellipse. And he got that from examining Tycho's data, uh, who didn't have any optical instruments. He had boards nailed to the wall, and he made measurements that were good enough for Kepler to analyze and come up with that that uh, they were all ellipses with the sun at a focus. The second planetary law of motion is that a planet, when it varies in its distance from the sun, when it's closer to the sun, it moves faster, and when it's farther away, it moves slower. He didn't know why, but he was sure that it did. And in fact, he uh, discovered that when a planet moves, say, for a month, at closest to the sun, it moves a longer distance, but it makes kind of a wide triangle. But when it's farthest away, it moves a shorter distance, but it's a long way from the sun. And it turns out the areas of those two triangles are the same. So the way he worded it was planets sweep out equal areas and equal time intervals. So that's the second law. And the third one, which we're looking at here, applies to comparing two different planets that have their own distances from the sun and their own year. And he discovered that the length of the year of a planet squared in Earth years was equal to the distance of that planet from the sun in astronomical units cubed. If you have trouble remembering which one is squared, which one is cubed, think of this is the time it takes to go around the sun. So think of time squared, time squared, like where we saw the ball drop a couple of weeks ago. OK, so that's the. Kepler's third law. Newton went and understood it. He had it all figured out and never published his results till Edmund Halley saw what he had there and said, you better publish this and I'll even pay for it. So they, that, that's how we happen to know a lot of these things is Halley paid to, once Newton figured out, he, he wasn't all that interested in publishing it. It was his own mental exercise that he did. But Newton refined this First of all, uh, this doesn't quite work for Jupiter and Saturn, the two biggest planets. It's off a little bit. And Newton figured out why and fixed it. The mass of the this over here should be a multiplier, the mass of the sun plus the mass of the planet in solar masses. 
Now, if you have a great big planet, this needs to be accounted for. But a little bitty planet like Mercury or the Earth even, um, this mass of the planet is so small compared to the mass of the sun that you can drop that off, can't you? And then all that's left is the mass of the sun, which in solar masses is one, which takes you back up to this left side here. Over here, the distance of the sun and the distance of the planet that's from their common center of mass as they orbit around each other. Now, for a big planet like Jupiter, when it orbits around the sun, the sun actually moves a little bit. That center of mass is still inside the sun, but it still moves some. Whereas the Earth, Mercury, don't have any effect on it. So the distance the sun moves can be dropped out for a small planet. And the distance of the planet here is what we're talking about here, the distance of the planet from the sun. So this reverts to that side. So Kepler got the chewing of it, and then Newton kind of got the reasons behind it and souped it up to where it worked for any planet at all. For tonight, the important part is that it also works for binary star systems. As long as we put the masses of the two stars in terms of solar masses, and their distances in terms of astronomical units and the periods in terms of Earth years. Once we do that, it works for a binary star system. So, and we, how do we get that? Well, for Sirius, we can just see it. We can see it going around. I mean, the Dogon didn't ever see it, but they knew about it. Uh, from other stars like Algol, we can look at the spectrum of it and we can get the period of the revolution, uh, either from eclipsing or from line shifting. If we can't see an eclipsing binary, there are all kinds of ways to get the period of revolution. If the star's distance is already known and we saw how we know how Sirius is 8.61 light years away, we also saw how large it looks in the sky, and we also saw the distance from one star to the other in astronomical units. There's our triangle. We can calculate the uh, distance uh, from, to get the sum of the masses. Here, uh, in the case of Sirius A and B, the, the sum of the masses is equal to the distance between them. That's the average separation in astronomical units and the period, 50.1 years, gives us 2.998 uh, solar masses. So we know what the two of them put together are. How do we separate that out? Well, this is what uh, Bessel noticed, was that this line here, where Sirius should be moving, was actually the blue line, Sirius A. It did wobble some as it moved along. And... Once they started keeping track of the Sirius B's motion, they saw that it moved more than that of Sirius A. And this is where I need an assistant. All you have to do is just stand up. And here we're going to do a thought experiment. We're both going to step on a turntable with ball bearings underneath with our toes together. And we're going to hold each other's hands and some of y'all are going to spin that turntable around pretty rapidly. And we have to lean over backwards to not fall off the turntable. And let's just suppose, which may be pretty good, that I weigh just about twice as much as you do. You're going to have to do most of the leaning to balance me. I don't have to do much leaning at all to balance you. In fact, I would have to lean back half as much as you would, or you'd have to lean back twice as much as I would which is what's going on right here. Sirius B leans out from the turntable twice as far as Sirius A, which means, therefore, that Sirius, the mass of Sirius A is twice that of Sirius B. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, then that sets up simultaneous equations, doesn't it? All we, we know the sum of the two is 2.998 solar masses. We know the ratio of the two is 2.065. So all we have to do is substitute this into here and work it down to the last line. And we see that the mass of Sirius B is 0.978 solar masses. Then we put this back into either equation up here. 
and we see that the mass of Sirius A is 2.02 solar masses. So that's how we know that. And this works for any time we find a binary star that we can figure out what its period is and get some idea of the distance between them, we can get their masses from that. This one, Newton's modification of Kepler's third law. Okay, the last quick run here is going to be through the part of stellar evolution that applies to Sirius A and Sirius B. We'll leave off white dwarfs. We'll leave off the tremendously interesting part about the blue giants and red supergiants and supernova explosions and, and neutron stars and black holes and all of that. That's got to be a separate time. We'll just concentrate on what stars like the Sun or Sirius or Sirius B would do. And those fortunately are all the same. We can focus in on them. And all of this is illustrated by y'all. Star formation begins in the dark nebulae, like the Horsehead Nebula in Orion. John Holderman, is he here tonight? He's on the Okay. Well, John, there's your picture of the Horsehead Nebula in Orion. It's one of the finest ones I've seen. And there's a dark nebula, and there's another dark nebula. That's where star formation begins. And dark nebula, where are they found? In the spiral arms of galaxies. Here's one, the spiral arms of our galaxies. This is by Brian Hancock. And this is uh, looking down towards uh, Scorpius. Here's the head of Scorpion, the uh, Antares, and the tail of the Scorpion coming up there, and the teapot and Sagittarius down here, and the lagoon nebula right there. And all of these uh, dark areas are gas and dust clouds that are can very well, and many do, harbor uh, the formation of new stars. Here's another one Merrill's got uh, of the NGC 2841 and Ursa Major. And look at all this junk in here, all this dark stuff that's all set to become new stars. And... Here's another one, the dark lanes in the Trifid Nebula with uh, John Holderman. Those are the dark lanes in there that are sites of new star formation. Uh, the force of gravity pulls all of these molecules together, especially considering they're so cold and not really moving very fast. And that condensation leads to the formation of new stars. And how long that takes depends on the star's mass. And it's probably, well, counterintuitive, I think. The more mass a star has, the faster it forms and the faster it evolves. Little flimsy, just barely stars take forever to get going and live practically forever. So one solar mass star like the sun takes about 50 million years to go from a, being a cloud to somewhere on the main sequence. A uh, 10 solar mass star on the other side of all the ones we're talking about tonight does the whole thing a whole lot faster, 200,000 compared to 50 million. Now, I just happen to have a graph here that shows all of these stars alighting on the main sequence from their gas clouds and how long it takes. A 15 solar mass star only takes 10,000 years to get going. So it just gets its stuff together in a hurry. The dark nebulae start turning into emission nebulae once the stars start forming inside and heating them up to where they start to glow. And the protostars excite the hydrogen atoms to emit red light. Well, that red light is the hydrogen alpha again. It gets it hot enough where the electrons get kicked up to the third energy level, falling back to the second. That puts out a, a color, deep color red light. Uh, 656 or something uh, nanometers. Those of you who use off-the-shelf digital uh, uh, cameras have probably noticed that you don't get very good pictures of nebulae a lot of times because uh, those detectors in the camera see into the infrared. So they put a filter in there to stop that from happening. Otherwise, people would glow in the dark. You know, you don't want anything warm to look like it's emitting light. So they put a filter in there. But the thing is, the filter goes into the red part of the spectrum just a little too far and blocks out the light from the 
three to two hydrogen alpha emission, which is the main thing you look for in the nebula. So uh, some of the, of the camera manufacturers have an astronomical version that has a little better filter in there that lets a little more of the uh, 700 nanometers come through and then cuts it off. It still don't see glow in the dark people, but you at least see, get to see the nebulae that way. And a lot of times you'll see new stars embedded in a glowing nebula. And here's a good example, the Lagoon Nebula in Sagittarius. Uh, this one's also by John. And you can see uh, cluster stars that probably was part of that and was formed in it. But the main ones we're seeing are down inside of here where it's really going to town. This may just be washed out because it's not white. It's just so bright red that it probably overexposed there. Uh, and here's a beautiful one by Clay Folks of the Orion Nebula. It always reminds me of a mimosa blossom. It's, it's really pretty. And you can see mainly the three to two, and there's some dark nebulosity there. The trapezium is right there where new stars are being formed. And I remember when that information first came out that, that Orion Nebula is a birthplace of new stars. And that was uh, back in the late 50s. They finally got onto that idea. Here's one by Tim Vent, whom I haven't seen in a good while, but you can see that he's seeing the uh, four to two drop, which has got a teal blue color to it instead of the three to two, because I think he may have been using a off the shelf DSLR and uh, the red was blocked. So this gives you a beautiful picture of the next uh, electron drop from the fourth to the second energy level. Eventually, all the gas and dust is used up forming the stars, and the, uh, they start to uh, turn into actual stars. When hydrogen is converted into helium and it gives off energy, they are on the main sequence doing that. Once they get on the main sequence, that forms a, the birth of the star is that nuclear reaction. And then the starlight that's put out reflects off the remaining wisps of nebulosity, and creates a reflection nebula. And here's the trifid again, but this time I'm going to look over here at this blue light. All these blue giant stars in here are reflecting their light off of this nebula. And since this is starlight here, it, this gives off a continuous spectrum. If you looked at that through a spectroscope, you'd see a, a typical peak image like you see for the sun or any other star. This over here, you're mainly going to see a line that the three to two uh, transition to give you the hydrogen alpha line. So they have different kinds of emission there. Here's probably the most famous emission or uh, reflection nebula, the Pleiades. But this is a little different because this nebulosity is not the nebula that the star cluster formed out of. They're just sort of passing through each other. And that's a fairly recent piece of information, but uh, they turn out to have all different proper motion. So it's well, you'd have to rule out that those stars came from that nebula. Finally, all the original nebula is gone, either incorporated into the stars or blown away by the heat and light from the new stars. And all that remains is a star cluster. And a good example of that's the double cluster in Perseus, one of my favorites in the autumn sky. And uh, this is one of Steve's pictures. And this is, uh, you can see the two clusters side by side. And in this one, you can see some of the stars that have turned into red giants and are now in the upper right-hand corner of the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. Okay, so after the new stars are formed, they spend most of the rest of their lives on the main sequence. And where it is depends on it's color, temperature, and nebulosity, of course, that's the coordinates of the graph. But what determines that? It's converting hydrogen into helium, thermonuclear fusion. We take a brief look at the reaction that's going on. I remember once uh, Michael wrote this whole thing out on the board, all the details of it. And you start out, this is the proton-proton chain. There's a proton, another proton forms a uh, heavy hydrogen or deuterium nucleus. And then uh, that picks up another proton and forms a uh, uh, light helium nucleus. Meanwhile, it does it again over here. You get these two together, 
you put these two together, you get a helium nucleus and uh, get a couple of protons back out again. If you add all this up, that's the overall reaction that takes place mainly in the sun. It's four hydrogens, helium, positrons, antimatter, and neutrinos that go immediately flying through the universe at nearly but not quite the speed of light. And the gamma rays that are the heat and energy that's produced that take millions of years to get to the surface. By that time, they've cooled down to where they're not gamma rays anymore. They're the visible light we see coming off of the surface of the star. Heavier stars like Sirius preferentially use a little different system. And that's the carbon nitrogen oxygen cycle. And we start out with a carbon 12 standard carbon nucleus. Um, a proton comes in, merges with it, turns it into a nitrogen nucleus, which gives off energy. And then it turns into, after it uh, uh, turns into a slightly heavy carbon, carbon 13, another proton comes in, more energy comes out, turns to standard nitrogen atom, picks up another proton and turns into a light oxygen atom. They should be 16. Then uh, that switches and gives off a neutrino, becomes uh, light nitrogen, uh, uh, heavy nitrogen again, picks up another proton, and a helium nucleus comes out. You can't see that under this, but that's the punchline of the thing. The helium comes out and the, uh, get the carbon back again. If you add all of this up, what do you see? It's the same reaction we had before. It's just the more roundabout way that's preferentially done in the nuclei of heavier stars. Okay, lifetimes of stars on the main sequence. Depends on their mass and luminosity. And this is just kind of common sense. This is how much, this is related to how much fuel it has. This is how fast it's burning the fuel. So the more fuel it has, the longer it lives, the faster it's burning it, the less it does that ratio times the lifespan of the sun gives you the lifetime of the star. And for Sirius, if we put in the mass of two and the mass of two and the luminosity of 25, this works out to where its lifetime's 800 million years, which is the figure you saw a little while ago. That's where that came from. But the luminosity depends on its mass since what deter what makes that reaction go? It's the gravity forcing everything, squashing it in the middle. And what determines that? How massive the star is. So the more massive it is, the faster that reaction goes and the more luminous it is. And the faster it uses up its supply of energy. So the more massive it is, the shorter its life. Uh, kind of like... Uh, athletes or actors or somebody, you know, they make billions of dollars, but they spend through it and die penniless where a school teacher <laughs> uh, doesn't make much, but doesn't spend much and lives on forever. So, <laughs> okay. Just that. Okay. I'm tempted to skip this because there is, this shows a relationship, but the equation is not good because it, if you put in the data for Sirius here, it tells you its luminosity is 11 when we know it's 25. So there's a kink in the curve and that's not expressed in the equation. So it's just not very good. But the punchline of this is right down here. The lifetime of stars on the main sequence really only depends on their mass ultimately. Okay, some examples, the sun, 10 billion years. Rigel lasts 4 million, which is because it's 60,000 times as luminous as the sun. It's really going through its fuel in a hurry. A red dwarf, uh, luminosity 0.35, can last 20 billion years, and the universe isn't that old yet. So there are any red dwarf still around. They haven't gone to the end yet. Okay, but once they use about 10% of their hydrogen, the pressure in the center isn't enough for that proton-proton reaction to go on anymore but there's mostly helium there. Imagine if you had a fireplace that after the logs burned out and you had ashes in the bottom, somehow those ashes could get together and start another fire that was hotter than the one you had from the logs in the first place. That's what happens in the center of one of these stars. The, the helium that's made there starts to fuse together, uh, called a helium flash, 
and it's called a triple alpha process because three helium nuclei, helium nucleus also called an alpha particle, especially when it's coming out of a radioactive nucleus, but it's the same thing. Uh, we get two alpha particles forming a beryllium nucleus. It picks up another helium nucleus and becomes carbon-12. So it's converting three heliums into carbon and energy, of course, way more. And when that happens, it makes uh, skipping a lot of stuff here. It can make heavier elements all the way down to iron. And they release more energy than just the hydrogen to helium. And the core temperature goes up to around a trillion degrees Kelvin at that time. <laughs> and that makes the star increase in diameter by a factor of 100 to 200 which is where these red giant stars come from. The star is just inflated from the insides being so hot. Uh, but then the outer layers cool down, which is why they're red. So it's huge, but red. So now it's now a red giant. So it's cooler than when it's on the main sequence. It also increases the luminosity. And so it's up in the upper right corner of the uh, HR diagram. While it's doing that, it sends out a shell of gases around itself. The, the expansion just keeps going, and it gets a little halo of gases around it, which forms a planetary nebula. It has nothing to do with planets, but uh, we call them that anyway because they kind of looked like planets to the ancients. Uh, the Dumbbell Nebula and Ring Nebula, these are both taken by uh, Freddie, and this Dumbbell Nebula picture is the best one I've ever seen. I've got it hanging up in our house. Uh, this is uh, the star that did it all right there. There's the planetary nebula. Here's one that's farther away. It looks like a little Cheerio in the telescope. It's, uh, you can see the star in the middle, and uh, it's a little older because it's opened up more. You can see the hole in the center, so it's a ring. Okay, then the, what happens to that star that did all that? It starts to contract again, getting hotter and yellower maintains its same luminosity. In other words, it's going left across the top of the HR diagram. It becomes unstable, pulsating in brightness and color. And those are variable stars. There's another whole talk in there, just see if variables are, or distance measurements and all of that. Eventually that star will shrink, keeping white hot, going down to become a white dwarf, like Sirius B. Comparable in size to the Earth, density, Interesting factoid, 6,000 tons per cubic foot, because its volume has decreased by a factor of a million, but a lot of its mass is still there. And then it finally becomes a black dwarf, but probably aren't any yet. And there's the comparison of the radius or curvature of the sun, the Earth, and Sirius B. And here's the second to last picture. The uh, it's What we were talking about was, come on, come on. Uh, going across the top, becoming unstable. And it wouldn't have killed them to make this graph a little bit wider so you could see it coming down this way to becoming a white dwarf. Uh, here's the life story of Sirius A and B. Started in a, in a nebula 230 million years ago. It, Sirius A was a white star, the mass, two solar masses, luminosity 25, it would have a lifetime of 800 million years on the main sequence. In other words, it's pretty much the same as it is now. It's like it was since it joined the main sequence. Sirius B was blue-white, bigger, five solar masses, a luminosity of 470. So it was a, really a beacon. It was much bigger than Sirius A. It would have a lifetime <laughs> shorter, 106 million years on the main sequence. So therefore, about 124 million years ago, Sirius B did become a red giant expelled the planetary nebula, lost 80% of its mass, went through the unstable phase and became a white dwarf with about one solar mass. If you can't see all of this at once, I've made a timeline for the very last slide. Sirius A, here is now, 230 million years ago, it started out, 570 million years from now, it will become the red giant and then a white dwarf as we uh, saw how that went. Sirius B started out brighter, blue-white, 106 million years uh, uh, before it turned into a red giant, then a white dwarf, 
And it's been that for the last 124 million years. And now it's the white dwarf. Well, if you look at that, this hasn't become red yet. This was red, but 124 million years ago. So it's been white for 124 million years. Well, that kind of answers the question, doesn't it? No matter what astronomy book or geology book or Bible you use, there weren't any people around 124 million years ago. So nobody has ever seen it being read, despite what the poets and philosophers said about it. So this wasn't all about Sirius, but it was a goodly amount. And I hope you enjoyed going through all the little byways and along the way. So thank you very much. I'll stay around for questions, even if you have to leave. Serious B uh, is the pup, right? Right. Uh huh. Have we ever seen a, a snapshot where a uh, from a nuclear uh, where it becomes a star, pro star, turns into a star? Oh yeah, the T Tauri stars are once just going towards the main sequence. They have halos around them where planetary disks are forming, and they're so surrounded with. Uh, nebulosity that you really can't see the star yet itself. We call them cocoon stars. You, uh, you, we've seen those processes. The one thing good about having so many trillions of stars out there is we can find one doing just about anything you want it to. So we, we've seen those. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bill, mm -hmm. someone mm -hmm. online asked a question. Where would hypergiants be on this chart? I'm assuming they're talking about the Hurst Sprung Russell. Yeah, right. They would be farther off to the upper left than we uh, even hinted at tonight. So, uh, but since none, none of the serious components are involved in that, they had to get cut. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is some real trivia. I feel like I'm six years old asking this question so if you don't know that's fine but this series b mm -hmm. back before it became the red giant mm -hmm. was very very bright mm -hmm. do yeah. we know would that have been the brightest star in the sky at the time well it almost certainly would have been because it's the, the dimmer one is now so yeah. it, it was so there's no now. other like current white dwarf well okay and, you're Okay, uh, yeah, that's what <laughs> You're asking me to have a reverse crystal ball here. Uh, <laughs> uh, there may have been some other stars that have blown themselves totally to bits. Like, yeah. like the thing that made the, uh, uh, not the Crab Nebula, but the uh, Veil Nebula in Cygnus. That, that was 100,000 years ago, probably, and who knows what that thing looked like to make all that wreckage. So it, it may have been some humdinger thing. But Imagining what ancient animals Looking back at this yeah. Yes. Yeah, that was pretty bright. Okay, that's going to make us extinct. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 Over one million years, mm -hmm. you'll travel about a parsec. Ah, so okay. One hundred and twenty-five million years uh, is enough time for something moving at a couple kilometers per second, mm -hmm. which is kind of this velocity dispersion mm -hmm. in the local standard of gravity, mm -hmm. to move a few hundred parsecs, which is mm -hmm. a long enough, ways. Yeah, enough yeah. to like take something that could be very close and mm -hmm. pretty far away. From yeah. So mm -hmm. even if it even if there wasn't anything, or vice versa in the or case of Sirius. Because exactly. it was farther away and it's yeah. closer. Yeah. But still so, not red. Yeah, but still yeah. not yeah. red. Yeah. Still yeah. not red. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, we mm -hmm. can probably work out what the brightest star is. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It may already be on one of these planetarium programs. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, excuse me. Distance of stars using the parallax. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, maybe a little more now with the Hipparco satellite. Yeah. Yeah. Are there additional methods to find ones that are much further? Oh, yes, yes. That is, is Jeremy, well, actually, we've got one of these online, the Cosmic Distance Ladder. If you go to our website and look up the Cosmic Distance Ladder, uh, you'll see how we measure things beyond that. We have to measure certain marker 
handle stars with the parallax and calibrate the cosmic distance ladder, and then we can go way beyond that up to red shifts. I mean, the galaxies we measure of, of billions of light years away, but not by parallax. Yeah. Standard candles are more. Those are the ones going across the top that I skipped right over. The Cepheid variables are our Lyrae variables. They either have a brightness corresponding to their period of fluctuation or they're all the same brightness like the R Lyrae. So once you know that and you see it off somewhere else, you use the formula to calculate the distance. So, but you have to calibrate them first. So just, just look at that. It's online. It's on our website. The Cosmic Distance Ladder. Yeah. We have a video of that presentation on our YouTube channel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We kind of dig through. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, several years ago. Yeah. And a, and a way to calibrate it better with the Lagrangian points. Uh, yeah, yes. yeah. In fact, we got the, uh, we did the PowerPoint for that one. Yeah, ago. yeah. So, that's, yeah. so that's, that's in there, so how we can improve on it. But nobody's done it. I guess nobody's looked at the video. Do, do you know if the James Webb is taking a picture of the Sirius system yet? I don't know. I'm not sure that they're not just looking at more spectacular things. Yeah. That, you got to start somewhere, and I think that most of the pictures I've seen have been a star formation and deep inside of clusters because it's infrared, and you can look through that haze of nebulosity right into what's going on. Mm. Anybody else? I've got some questions, but I'm going to go ahead and dismiss everybody. Yeah. And, uh, thank you for but you don't have out. to go. <laughs>